if nothing else works. Um, but I've also seen sources saying not to use it because of the irritable myocardium precipitate dyspnea's um, actually, and also for like toxic drones, especially like calcium channel blockers, because like even if you're pacing the heart, there's not enough calcium for the myocardium to contract. Um, also, if you're thinking of like the brash syndrome, you want to treat the hyperkalemia, um, and so uh, TBP. Um, also, like if they had an MI, they received thrombolytics, there's an increased risk of bleeding. Um, yeah. um, so, you want to start off with transcutaneous pacing while you're setting up the TBP, going down this route. Um, the reason being is that it's, it's faster and Use it interim until you set everything up. Um, the thing is that you have to give sedation and analgesia. It's very uncomfortable. Um, you can try benzos, you can try fentanyl, you can try ketamine. Um, issues with transcutaneous pacing is that there is a lot of cadences because you have the wall, the skin, soft tissue, everything. Um, so you have to use a higher energy level, which causes patient discomfort. Um, and so what do you need for the TVP? So you want the TVP kit. Um, at county, it's in the pixels. You have to ask the nurses to get it for you. Um, I do want to point out that the size of the TVP itself is quite French, and the catheter that is. Um, in our kit, the cordis is already in the kit, and so it's going to be like a six French cordis. But if you are somewhere where this is separate, you want to make sure you grab a six French um, because there are courses that are like a nine French and it's meant for a seven, five to eight French um, catheter. And this has actually happened to me at Lutheran. Um, and, and you have to use like a swan scan catheter at that point, uh, which cardiology has to get. Um, so, yeah, just be mindful of the size. Um, so this is what is inside of the kit. Um, so in particular, I want to point out the sheath, um, the cordis itself. So this is the sheath. This is the cordis, and it's already preloaded with the dilator. Um, there's also a syringe that's that will inflate the balloon, and it's already it will stop at I think one cc. Um, so you want to check the balloon. Um, so these are the different types of transducers. Um, I've seen this one in CCT, um, but we have a new one that's in the pixels. So you have to ask questions to grab. It looks like this. Um, I was told at UHB it's in the cabinets. Um, so this is all. I, like it points out all the things that you need to know. So for TVP, you want to use a ventricular connection, not doing atrial. Um, and you want to set the heart rate between 60 and 120. Um, the atrial you're going to set to zero. For the ventricular current, um, you can start at five. If they're really unstable, you might want to start higher, 220, and then work down as you see after. Um, everything else is just going to leave alone. Um, in terms of the anatomy, you're tr going to try to do the right IJ replacement because they want to keep the left subclavian permanent phase maker. Um, so, yeah. So, this is a video on the procedure itself. A quick schematic overview of what the right IJ ventricle, the pacing wire comes out the SVC and through the right when you're all set up. From the right ventricle, the pacing wire comes out the SVC and through the right IJ, where you place it, you have a sterile sleeve over the top of the sterile pacing wire. This syringe inflates and deflates the balloon, and then through adapter pins, it plugs into the connecting cable, which goes into the pacing generator. So once you consent your patient, and we already had an informed discussion, you're going to fairly prep and drape your patient, and then you're going to put in that right IJ line. I'm just going to assume you all know how to do that part, so let's jump ahead. Once you've got your cordis in the IJ, now you can remove the wire and the dilator, and you can do this all in one motion. 
plug the connecting cable into the pacing generator. This is typically sterile. This is not. So you want to have a non-sterile assistant help you with this. Ours can actually be atrial or ventricularly paced. But we'll put this in the RV. So I'm going to plug this into the V. Now that the connecting cable is all set up, we're going to check the balloon on our pacing wire and make sure that works. So you're going to use the small syringe and the one with the plunger. I mean, this can't draw up any more air than what it allows, and that's a good thing because you don't want it to rupture the balloon. So we're just going to confirm that our balloon actually does inflate. And then you're going to deflate the balloon, keep the stop top open, and now we're going to use our sterile sleeve. So the sterile sleeve direction really matters. This side is going to connect to the cortex, which means that the wire has to feed through it this way. So we're going to feed the wire through the sterile sleeve. And now we're ready to put this wire in. Now, if you have an ultrasound machine and a skilled sonographer, now is a great time to recruit some help and get a sub side point of view. That way you can watch this wire going into the RV. And remember, we're following the curvature of the wire here, so it curves into the right ventricle. Wait, what if I don't have ultrasound? No big deal. It's all good. You can do this by watching the cardiac monitor and looking for an injury pattern, which we're going to show you in just a second. So for now, you're going to continue inserting this wire until you get to the 20 centimeter mark, which is indicated by the two black lines on the wire. Now you know that the tip of your wire and therefore the balloon are just outside the cortis sheath. That's a good thing. We don't want to pop that balloon. Now we can connect the adapter pins to our pacing wire. And these are going to get plugged in to our connecting wire over here. And negative goes to negative, positive goes to positive. Remember, this is not sterile. So you want to have an assistant help you with this portion. We're going to set this up, have them turn on the pacing generator. And the rate on this one is set to 8. It's okay if you go slower than that, since their intrinsic rate is going to be much slower than that. We don't have to pace the atrium, we just have to pace the ventricle. So this one has options for both, but we're just pacing the ventricle. And I have the output set at 5 milliamps. You can adjust that if you want. You could go a bit higher if you want to turn it up. You can also change the sensitivity. The sensitivity here is set at 3, but if you are troubleshooting and it's picking up some sort of intrinsic rate, then you can turn that sensitivity down to 0. We're just going to leave it at three for now. Now we're going to insert the wire a little bit further so that we can float the balloon in. So we're going to push that wire down to the 30 centimeter mark, which of course is indicated by the three black lines on the pacing wire. Now it's at 30 centimeters, and I'm going to go ahead and inflate that balloon. And now, probably another five centimeters or so, and as I do this, I'm looking at the cardiac monitor and I'm looking for that injury pattern that looks like a STEMI and the V1. That's it right there. And you can confirm this on ultrasound if you have it. If the wire is being pesky and just coiling up in the RA, you're going to want to back it out, rotate the wire, and re-advance it to try to direct it into the RV. And then once you've got it, remember to confirm mechanical capture with palpation of the pulse, or you can do it with pulse ox. So I like the positioning of where this is, and now we're going to adjust the pacing generator just to turn down that output until we barely lose capture, and then turn it back up again. Okay, so I like the position. I'm getting good capture. I have confirmation on my cardiac monitor. So I'm going to deflate the balloon, and then lock this stop clock in place. And we're going to pull that sterile sleeve all the way down to the cortis, and it connects here. Now you can open up the sterile sleeve. And this actually locks when you twist this piece. It locks it in place on the pacing wire. So this is really it. You're pretty much done at this point. You're just going to... Um, so once you're finished and you pull the sheet all the way out, you want to want to secure it by suturing um, the line to the patient and also coiling the sheet as well um, to give it some slack in case it does jam on it. You don't want it to come out or dislodge on um, any capture. Um, here are some cool videos I found. Um, 
casing using a transcutaneous? I don't think you can, right? It has to be the transvenous going into the atrium. I'm not sure. Yes. Yeah, right? I think it's very difficult. Yeah, but the transcutaneous goes right to the ventricle. You have to think, use the transvenous when an overdrive case. Dr. G was saying that if you want to do overdrive pacing, you have to use the transvenous. You can't use transvenous. The other thing is a very good point you made. I just want to emphasize it. The one that we see here and uh, is that if the metabolic milieu, as you said, is messed up, the pacing won't work. So like you said, if they're beta blocker overdose or a calcium channel overdose or did, it may not work. Um, and one that I've seen not work that you really have to treat metabolically is hyperkalemia. Uh, so if you have someone who's hyperkalemic and break a heart, really the only thing to do is give them calcium, not to mess around with uh, putting in face. Yeah, the other situation where it doesn't work very well is hypothermia. So especially in the winter months if your patients come in environmental or uh, they'll be bradycardic. Um, they might be hypotensive, but you really just have to reform them. Um, when they're that cold, the myocardium frequently won't respond to. This goes, and this goes for uh, arrests too. If you're trying to relate, uh, you do want to tap even if they're mid, but doing repeated fibrillations are probably not going to work. Well. So it's probably worth all try once. And, uh, and pacing, it's probably better to spend your time working on uh, rapid. There's just a, one other thing. There are two ways to actually monitor if you're in the right place. So one is the way that you showed on the video is where you just go in and you're watching the person on the monitor. 
uh, and seeing if you get that monophasic curve of injury. And then as soon as you get that, you know, you have them hooked up to the pacer. The other is you can take an alligator clamp and put that on the V-lead and attach that to the negative pole. And as you go through, you can see the P wave changes. Um, as you're as you're getting in, it goes from being upside down to come in, and then you can see the monophasic curve as it hits. And then you hook it up to your pacemaker. I don't know if I made that sense, but you can you can use that to help guide you of where you are as you're passing it. So there are two different ways of doing it. One is just go in and connect it, and the other one is to use the EKG to show where you are. Yeah, I like the videos you showed. Um, you showed they're like a subside approach where you can't come out with it or any of the ones where you can see that chamber. Um, even if you think of the density of uh, wire in the kit you have, you want to necessarily see it a hypercode like what you saw in the video, but you don't see the effects of it. I mean, if I can't see the blue and the little kind of wire coming across, the second it touches that myocardium, you're seeing is a directility. So you have like that very objective, like visual for it. Um, why do you have to use that? Sometimes, unfortunately, those leaves fall off, they're diaphoretic, you can't see them on the monitor. In the case of being paced, and there's so much contraction that you can't even actually get a good reading on there. So that's, that's almost what's nice to have a, a second way of Great, thanks, Aki.